All right, so in the last video, we derived a way of thinking about the amplitude response and phase response of a discrete time LTI system in terms of its pull in zero locations. In this video, we're going to go ahead and work through some examples where we plot different transfer functions and then plot their corresponding amplitude response. So if you go to the web page, I have a nice uh, MATLAB script that lets you kind of arbitrarily place poles and zeros in the complex plane. So if you see right here, I have a very simple example to start. I just have two pole locations. It's a complex conjugate pair of poles, and they're relatively close to the unit circle. You know, they're getting close, but not quite on the unit circle. In MATLAB, once you define where those poles and zeros are, then the script will generate the amplitude response of that system that you've written down. The key thing to remember here is that as we walk around the unit circle, so we start here at omega equals zero, and then we come here to omega equals, you know, about pi over four, then omega equals pi over two, and then all the way over here to omega equals pi. What we are going to keep track of is how far away is this point on the unit circle away from pole locations. Remember, the numerator of my amplitude response is a product of distances to zeros. The denominator is a product of distances to poles. So what happens is when I get to a point on the unit circle that is very close to a pole, for instance, this pole right here is very close to that spot on the unit circle, I have a term on my denominator that is very small. So when that small term is on the denominator, it ends up making my amplitude response peak at that particular value of omega. And that's exactly what has happened right here. This peak right here at that value of omega is due to this pole right there. Similarly, this peak right here at that value of negative omega is due to this pole right here. So our strategy usually is start at zero and then just kind of walk around the unit circle and mentally just keep track of how far away am I from poles and zeros. As I get close to poles, I get peaks. As I get close to zeros, I get zeros. So that's a very simple example here with only two poles. Let's start making things a little bit more complicated. All right, so here on example two, I kept my original two poles, but I added an additional pole right here. So right here is omega equals zero. I'm now close to a pole, so guess what? I got an additional peak right there at omega equals zero. Now I still get kind of a little bump right here at that particular value of omega that corresponds to this peak, but that peak's not as pronounced now due to this additional pole right there. Let's go ahead and modify this one again. Let's go ahead and add another pole out there. So we still have our initial peak at zero due to this pole. And I have a peak right here due to this pole. But now over here at a higher value of omega, I have a peak right here. So you can kind of see counting the number of poles close to the unit circle kind of tells me how many ripples or how many peaks I'm going to have here in my amplitude response. It's not horribly precise, right? If I was sketching this as a cartoon, getting the exact value on the uh, y-axis, exactly how high that is would be challenging. But by walking around, I can kind of sketch out the general shape of the amplitude response. Let's go ahead and bring in some uh, zeros now. So exact same plot we had before in example three, but now in example four, I've put a zero out here. And you'll notice what happened previously. Out here, as I got close to omega equals pi, that value of the curve is slightly above zero, right? It's not quite touching zero there. But when I come into this example and I've put a zero out there, it actually goes to zero at omega equals pi. That's because when I am at that point on the unit circle, my distance to that zero is a zero. And that's the numerator term, right? The numerator has all the products of distances to zeros. I now have a zero. At that point of omega, I'm zero away. So I actually go to zero right there at that value of omega. Let me go ahead and add some more zeros here. I actually added them on the unit circle. Remember, it's okay to have zeros on the unit circle. It doesn't make things unstable. It's poles on the unit circle you have to worry about. So at both of those frequencies now, probably around that omega right there, I'm gonna to go to zero. So I kind of stayed zero for this whole stretch of frequencies due to this zero kind of tacking down things and that zero kind of tacking down things. All right, so that's kind of a nice little sequence of examples. We kind of walk through how do you place poles and zeros in the complex plane and how does that change the amplitude response of the system? It changes it in terms of 
the distances to those poles and zeros. The numerator has distances to zeros. The denominator has distances to poles. So as you get close to a pole, you tend to have peaks. As you get close to a zero, you have zeros. We could do a similar thing for this phase response. Remember the phase response you can think of as sums of angles. I personally just think about that as a little bit more challenging. Adding up all the angles and keeping track of that is a little tougher, but you can do it. Obviously, if you have a computer, you can always just plug in the exact math and evaluate this very precisely. But sometimes be able, being able to do this kind of by hand and at least sketch out what the amplitude response looks like in a rough sense is a very useful thing to do. Also, if you want, you know, go to the website and you can download the script that lets you do this very generally. You can go make a pole zero plot for whatever filter you want, and then it'll pop out the corresponding amplitude response. Thanks for watching.